problems. Trying to control the mind with the mind is like trying to grab fog. It's, it's vapors, you're never gonna grab it. The nervous system includes the brain, but also all the connections to the body and yeah. back again. And so the, when you can't control your mind, you wanna do something purely mechanical. All trauma, anxiety, fears, they all map back to stress in some way. Now you can have stress without trauma, you can have anxiety without trauma, but you can't really have trauma without stress and anxiety. Even though there aren't really strict definitions of the boundaries between trauma and stress and fear, I think it's fair to say that trauma is a fear and or stress response that's happening at the wrong times, right? It's sort of carrying over from an experience that's making life uncomfortable or in some cases exceedingly challenging. So the first thing for anyone trying to navigate stress is to understand in what kind of stress they're dealing with. Are you exhausted and having a hard time getting your energy up? Or is your energy too high and you're having a hard time getting your energy down? Because the solutions to those are often quite different. It's very hard to control the mind with the mind. It can be done. I say when in moments of stress, either excessively alert stress or excessively fatigued stress, look to the body because mm. there are mechanisms that have been built into the body designed to do this. Now, the reason I can say that is that the physiological side, the double inhale, exhale, is controlled by a specific set of neurons in the brainstem that Jack Feldman's lab discovered. Inhale emphasized breathing can be practiced in a way, sort of away from stress in a kind of offline approach that can be beneficial for raising what we call stress threshold. So there's a whole other way to look at stress, which is to say, how do I get calmer <clears throat> in the mind when my body is freaking out? On the other side of things, when you're feeling overwhelmed and fatigued, there are two ways to approach that. First is the kind of foundation of fatigue, which is almost always poor sleep and scheduling of sleep. This is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. And I don't think I've discussed this on any podcast previously, but you know, getting better at sleeping is a whole set of practices. But sleep is a slow tool. It's not a real-time tool. Because mm. if you're feeling exhausted and you have to get up and have your day, deal with children, deal with work, deal with life, we can talk about how to get better at sleeping. But in real time, what you want to do is you want to bring more alertness into the system. Focus and alertness. The way to do that is to take advantage of a very well-established medical fact, all medical students learn this, all MBs know this, which is that there's a direct relationship between how you breathe and your heart rate. Hmm. So when we inhale, when we inhale, it almost feels like everything's moving up, but actually what happens is our diaphragm moves down. When that happens, our heart literally gets a little bit bigger. The volume of the heart gets a little bit bigger, which means that whatever blood in there is moving per unit time a little bit slower. And there's a set of neurons in the heart called the sinoatrial node that sends a signal to the brain and says, hey, blood flow is slowing down. And the brain sends a signal back to the heart and says, okay, let's speed up and speeds up the heart rate. So the short, concise way to put it is when you inhale more vigorously or longer, you're speeding up your heart rate. This is, uh, this actually, there's a name for it in the medical community, but the important thing to understand is as you inhale, you're sending a neural signal to your heart to speed up. And when you exhale, the diaphragm moves up. The heart gets a little bit smaller, literally, because there's less space there. Then there's a signal sent to the brain and the brain sends a signal back and says, slow down the heart rate. So if you want to become more alert, you actually can just simply make your inhales a little bit more vigorous or a little bit longer than your exhale. Longer or more vigorous inhales will speed up your heart rate and make you more alert. Longer or more vigorous exhales will slow down your heart rate and make you less alert. The repetitive breathing more quickly and deeply, this kind of thing, or some variant of that all through the mouth or all through the nose, brings up the heart rate and causes the adrenal glands, which sit right above the kidneys, to secrete adrenaline. They make you more alert. And you see these big inflections in heart rate when people do this. Typically, it makes people feel agitated at first. They feel a little bit agitated. 
And then when you exhale and hold your breath for 15 seconds or so, or what you're doing essentially is you're learning to be calm as your body is flooded with all this adrenaline and the heart rate is going. And that is 100% top-down control. Mm. What you're doing in those moments is you're learning to take your forebrain and say, fight the temptation to move, fight the temptation to breathe. This particular pattern of breathing, 25 or 30 times followed by an exhale and a hold, and then a big inhale and a hold, sometimes doing more in mm -hmm. inhaling and exhaling type repetitive breathing. That is really somebody training themselves how to self-induce stress. And we know from some good literature mm. and some emerging science that's still ongoing that it is possible to get comfortable in these agitated states so that your mind is okay, feels okay when the body is feeling like it wants to tremble or move, that you can learn to suppress that activity. The ice bath is another good example of mm -hmm. this. Some people go straight to the ice bath because cold water will almost always induce a low level of stress in people. You have to, you have to kind of fight it. Even if you learn to love it, you still have to every time jumping right. in there, okay, I gotta con right. control the mind essentially to that's calm. Right. Exactly, so the body is saying, this is really cold. <laughs> Get this out. is really cold. Get, Get out. out now. And you're pushing back on that and it's top-down control. Mm -hmm. It's pure top-down control. And you could do this any number of ways. There's actually a uh, something called the hour of pain. The, um, the hour of pain was actually described to me by a, f a friend of mine, a uh, former military special operations guy, who said that you, they place you, this wasn't through military, but this is a kind of a, a outside the military Extracurricular activities. Yeah, extracurricular activity. activities <laughs> of placing you into one position on, uh, on the floor and you have to stay there for an hour, which can be excruciating. There's so much limbic friction where you want to move so badly because the stabilizing muscles of the body and the feedback in our muscular skeletal system says, move, move, move. I just want to move the tiniest bit. And so all that practice is, it's just a different version of the ice bath. Yes. It's you're learning top-down control. So, you know, we started off with a question about trauma. Yes. And we'll get there. <laughs> but I think it's very important just to kind of summarize that people understand to just ask themselves the question, if I, am I feeling too much agitation or am I feeling too much exhaustion? If it's too much agitation, emphasize exhales and do the physiological sigh. Yoga Nidra is also a wonderful practice that is kind of the mirror image of uh, super oxygenation breathing. It involves long exhale breathing, lying down on your back, completely relaxing your body mm -hmm. and learning to completely turn off thinking, which sounds hard, but you can learn how to do it very quickly if you do that practice for about 10 minutes a day. Yeah.